welcome to the official Mountain View Church podcast. For information about our gathering times, location, or how you can connect with us, visit us at mvc.life. We're exploring three books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And they're all asking the question, what does it mean to live well in this world? So we've looked at Proverbs, who you could think of as a bright young teacher. She's all about pursuing wisdom, an attribute of God that's woven into reality. And she's optimistic that if you use wisdom, you will build a successful life. But then we come to Ecclesiastes, who's more like this sharp middle-aged critic. And he says, You think using wisdom will bring you success. You'd better think again, because life here under the sun is meaningless. And that's a phrase he uses a lot in this book. But to understand this book, we have to realize first that we're hearing two voices. So first there's the teacher, and we've been calling him the critic. He's the main voice in the book. But he is introduced to us by another figure, the author. And he's the one who's collected the critic's words and then at the end of the book summarizes everything and gets the final word. So why does the author want us to hear from the critic? Well, he wants to turn your view of the world upside down. And he's going to let the critic explore three really disturbing things about the world. And we should warn you, these are pretty intense. Yeah. So the first is the march of time. Or as the critic says, Generations come and generations go. But the earth, it's been here long before us and will be long after. No one remembers people from long ago and all the people yet to come, they too will be forgotten by those who come after them. So on a cosmic scale, you and I, we are just a blip. Stars are born and then they die and form planets which orbit new stars. And those planets, they change over time and eventually burn up. And amidst this cosmic backdrop, my entire existence is like a blink in time. Which leads to the critic's second disturbing observation, that we are all going to die. Humans face the same fate as the animals, death. All people, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, those who offer sacrifices to God and those who do not, they all share the same destiny. All this activity and madness, then we all join the dead. Man, this book is depressing. And so is the final disturbing thing for the critic, and that is life's random nature. So in Proverbs, life isn't random. There's a clear cause and effect relationship between doing the right thing and being rewarded. But the fact is that life doesn't always work that way. The critic has observed a glitch in the system. He calls it chance, or in his words, The race doesn't always go to the swift, or the battle to the strong, nor does food always come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the educated. Time and chance happen to them all. So his point is that you can't really control anything in life. It's just way too unpredictable. So if I want to master life, then you're setting yourself up for a fall. Now, throughout the book, the critic uses a metaphor to tie together all of these disturbing ideas. Nearly 40 times, he says that everything in life is hevel. It's a Hebrew word that means smoke or vapor. Like smoke, life is beautiful and mysterious. It takes one shape, and before you know it, it takes a new shape. And smoke looks solid, but try and grab it, it'll slip right through your fingers. And when you're stuck in the thick of it, like fog, it's impossible to see clearly. Now our modern translations have lost the metaphor, and they usually translate hevel as meaningless. But if you read closely, the critic isn't saying that life has no meaning, but rather that its meaning is never clear. Like smoke, life is confusing, it's disorienting and uncontrollable. So what are we supposed to do with all of this? Well, surprisingly, the critic first of all acknowledges the perspective of Proverbs. He says it's a really good idea to learn wisdom and to live in the fear of the Lord. Really? I mean, he just said that doesn't guarantee success. But he knows it's the right thing to do. But secondly, and more often, he says that since you can't control your life, you should stop trying. Learn to hold things with an open hand because you really only have control over one thing, and that's your attitude towards the present moment. Stop worrying 
he says, and choose to enjoy a good conversation with a friend, or the sun on your face, or a good meal with people that you care about. The simple things in life. Yes, and both the good things and the bad, because both are rich gifts from God. And that's the surprising wisdom of Ecclesiastes. Listening to the critic is painful and can lead you into some dark places. And that's why the author speaks up at the end of the book. He doesn't want you to lose hope. He wants to make you humble into someone who trusts that life has meaning even when you can't make sense of it, that one day God will clear the heaven and bring his justice on all that we've done. And so he tells us that the proper response to all of this is to fear the Lord and keep his commandments. And that's the book of Ecclesiastes. Now there's one more voice in the Bible's wisdom literature, and that's the book of Job. And he will bring us the final, much needed perspective on our journey into wisdom. Mm. Hevel, it's all Hevel. Or as the, uh, this version of the Bible says that I'm, I'm quoting from today, the NRSV, um, vanity of vanities, says the teacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. This critic bookends his speech and the whole you know, main content of the book with that statement. And again, he repeats it again and again throughout the whole thing. I think they said 40 times he repeats this. And he just says it's, it's vain. And um, you know, this whole book basically is the original nihilist writer or the original postmodern, even before modern was a thing, you know, this was like way back in the day. But basically, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is critiquing the wisdom tradition of Israel. It's critiquing the book of Proverbs. It's, a, it's critiquing simple answers that say the righteous, if you're righteous, you'll do well. If you suffer, you know, if you're wicked, you'll suffer. Uh, if you're wise, then things will go well for you. If you're a fool, they won't. And it basically turns all of that on its head and says, not always. It doesn't always work that way. And in fact, this teacher who's the central figure, this critic in this story, is actually tied into the same wisdom tradition as the book of Proverbs. Proverbs said that it was Solomon that wrote a lot of it and that he collected other wisdom. This one talks about how the teacher collected lots of wisdom, wrote lots of Proverbs, and how he was king in Israel, and he did all of these things. In fact, let me read to you what it says about him, how he introduces himself. I, the teacher... When king over Israel and Jerusalem applied my mind to seek and search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven, it is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that were done under the sun and see all is vanity and chasing after the wind. Again and again, he uses these, these ideas of vanity and chasing after the wind. He says, listen, if you are going to seek for meaning in this life, he, he actually goes on to say, I've looked for it in everything. I tried, you know, being really rich, and I had as much riches as you could possibly have. I tried building great, you know, buildings and building projects, and I built great buildings. I had great businesses. I bought male and female servants. I had a whole harem full of women to meet my every need. I ate. I drank. I did everything possible. I de denied myself nothing and took every kind of pleasure. I tried wisdom. I tried folly. And he said, it's all hevel. He said, it's all smoke. And no matter what you try to do to find meaning in your life, it's just going to slip through your hands like smoke. He says, this instead is, is what his conclusion is. Again and again, like six times in this letter, he says, there's nothing better than this. And in chapter two, he says, there's nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil this also, I know, is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? This is his conclusion again and again. There's nothing better than just eat, drink, enjoy your life while you have it, even your toil and your work. Enjoy it because that's all you get. And there's no guarantees about what happens later. There's no guarantees that if I just get just around the river bend, there's something better. Or, you know, if I get that new promotion, if I get that new job, if I just can get that girl to fall in love with me, whatever that thing is, it's hevel. He goes on and he gives the same conclusion again and again in chapter three. He says, I know that there's nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. 
Moreover, it's God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. See, he, he's not leaving God out of this. It's not completely godless, but he's saying, hey, that's all you get. God gave that to you. He says it again in the end of that chapter. So I saw that there is nothing better than that they should enjoy their work, for that's their lot. Who can bring them to see what will happen after them? He goes through and he's critiquing the perspective that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And he pulls it, like this is kind of a summary of how he says it in in chapter seven. He says, in my vain life, I have seen everything. There are righteous people who perish in their righteousness and there are wicked people who prolong their life in their evil doing. He says, do not be too righteous and do not be too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be too wicked and don't be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of the one without letting go of the other. For the one who fears God will avoid all extremes. Now that's a different perspective than you would think you would hear in the Bible. Don't be too righteous. Don't be too wise. Eh, Don't be too wicked either. But you know, the one who fears God really holds on to all of it and it's not too extreme. That's a different perspective. But here's the thing I love about the book of Ecclesiastes. We need different perspectives. And the Bible is not, you know, afraid of giving us the different perspectives of different people at different times in their life. And this critic, though he's a man who is tearing everything down and deconstructing what he knows of his faith, he has an important message that the author of Ecclesiastes and that the Holy Spirit, who made sure it got put in the Bible, wants you to hear. Like there's actually value in this doubt in this deconstruction, in, you know, doubting things down to be able to say, you know, I don't know if what I used to believe really works anymore. Because this is maybe even Solomon critiquing his own previous wisdom. Because the character is very similar in that and what it talks about. And so he goes on again to give the same conclusion in in chapter 8. So I commend enjoyment. For there's nothing better for people under the sun than to eat and drink and enjoy themselves. For this will go with them in their toil through the days of the life that God gives them under the sun. And so he comes to this fuller conclusion and he says it this way, go, eat your bread with joy. And and, and what's interesting is he says this right after he says, so I've seen everything under the sun and I was so depressed because life is futile and it's all terrible. And he just sinks into this terrible depression. He says, I hated life. And I thought, those that are dead are better off than those living, and the ones who have never been born are even better off still. He says, you know, basically, life sucks. It's terrible. (laughs) But then he says this, because he he realizes that depression and despair doesn't work either. That, too, is hevel. But he says this. He says, so go, eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has long ago approved of what you do. Let your garments always be white and do not... Let oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife you love all the days of your vain life that are given to you under the sun. (laughs) Because that's your portion. That's all you get. In life and in your toil in which you toil under the sun, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you're headed. It's encouraging, right? I've never had somebody ask me to read that at their wedding. (laughs) Can you pick a Bible verse to read? (laughs) Yeah, I got a good one. Enjoy life with your wife that you love all the days of your meaningless life. (laughs) While you have time, since you're on your way to hell. (laughs) But what's great about this is that God actually thinks we need this perspective. Because, you know, we need different perspectives. And, and one of the things that I've learned in my life is, is that um, it's, it's, not, it's not bad to have different perspectives and even to doubt some things and even to be pessimistic from time to time. God doesn't want us to stay there. But like any of us, if you live long enough, and you walk through your life, and you go through enough changes and enough trials in life, and you observe enough things, and if you're paying attention, your views on God and on your life and how what you believed before, they're going to change. And if they're not changing, you're not thinking about them enough, or you don't believe them strongly enough. 
Because you can hold views on the surface that never change because they never actually made a difference in your life. It's like that if thing. If God is real, then it makes a difference in how you live. But if your beliefs have never changed, I would submit to you, you're not living them. You don't really believe them. And so, um, so, so this, this story goes on and, and basically the, uh, the, the author comes back to get the final word because he wants to say, okay, I know the teacher's philosophy is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But let me just remind you of this. And he says this, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of everyone. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So like, go ahead, listen to the teacher, eat, drink, and be merry, pay attention to that, live in the moment, enjoy your life, but just remember, God's still on the throne, and he's still a judge, and he's still going to do what's fair. And as I, as I listened to this, and I thought about the conclusions of this author and of this critic, and I, I thought about my own journey, um, I wanted to read to you something that I wrote about 10 years ago as I sat down to kind of think through my own journey, because, um, you know... As a pastor, I take my faith very seriously. I take the things I believe very seriously. But in the course of life, my beliefs have changed a lot of times. And I've had plenty of doubts. And what I want to talk about a little bit today is how do we hold on to faith when certainty is no longer an option? When we've lost certainty, how do we hold on to faith? And it's entirely possible and it's really important. And the reason I want to do this is because I've talked to a lot of people that are really struggling in their faith. They're, they're deconstructing their faith. They're tearing down kind of like things they always assumed. But listen, just because you're tearing down how you've interpreted God or the Bible or whatever, like, is your interpretation that was wrong? It's not God. Like, he'll get you through this. So don't be afraid of doubt and discouragement and changing your beliefs and learning new things that overturn other things that you used to believe. It's unsettling for sure. But if you stay in it, God will lead you through it. So I, I want to share with you a little bit of my journey about that. And so I'm going to read this to you. Um, it's kind of a, a book that I started and then I, I never finished. I'm a better starter than a finisher. In fact, I probably would never finish a sermon if I didn't have Sunday morning roll around every single week. <laughs> But I'll read this. It's called After Certainty, and it uh, starts this way. I think I've been after certainty all my life, but I can't be sure. <laughs> I come from a long line of certain people. My grandfather was certain the doctors had killed my grandmother and were trying to kill him. They finally got him. My mom was certain God had healed her of cancer. In fact, God appeared to her in a dream and told her so just a few months before she died. My dad was certain his Amway business would give him the financial freedom he always wanted. In fact, he was certain about Herbalife, Shackley, a gold mine, MVM, and anything his friend Elias was cooking up. My dad was certain about everything. Soccer was a communist sport. My, my college education was turning me into a liberal. Jesus was a reformed Baptist. And Tulip explained everything I needed to know about the gospel. Growing up with a dad, or my, growing up without a dad and being raised in the Marine Corps and by his football coach certainly shaped my dad into the man that he was. Being raised by him certainly affected me. While we're not completely a product of our DNA and our environment, we certainly don't fall far from the tree where we first budded. I've been in half a dozen multi level marketing businesses, I've invested in a number of sure things that were quick ways to lose money. And I've had the contagious optimism to lead my family and friends on many of these ventures by the sheer power of earnest belief. I've been sincere, and I've been sincerely wrong. That brings me to the subject of this book, certainty. I've pursued it, I've held it in my own hands, and I've lost it again and again. I've believed and disbelieved enough to question everything I thought I knew. How many times have I been certain that something was so, only to find out that it wasn't? And this leads me to the big, scary question that's always been running in the background of my operating system, but only recently has been allowed on the screen of my mind. It feels naughty even to say it out loud. What if the big stuff is uncertain? What if the things I hold most dear and believe so strongly turn out to be wrong? What if there is no God? What if the Bible isn't reliable? What if my faith is wishful thinking? What if I'm simply wrong about this like I was about so many other things? So the question I'll explore is this, how 
does our faith work after certainty is no longer an option? It started with my mom's cancer. She didn't deserve it. She was pretty healthy. She always told me not to stand in front of the microwave or I'd get cancer. My great-grandmother would have been a more likely candidate. I have pictures of her at my wedding well into her 80s with a cigarette in one hand and her oxygen mask in the other hand. (laughs) It wasn't just clean living and moral goodness that should have made my mom immune to cancer. She had faith, the kind of faith that Jesus says can move mountains. She believed God could, would, and had healed her. For Joanne Redarmel, faith was not a set of beliefs or a Sunday morning hobby. The woman believed every word of the Bible. If it said, ask and you shall receive, she believed it. If it said, by his stripes we are healed, she claimed it and wouldn't allow any doubters to hang around her or tell her otherwise. I used to believe like that. When I was in high school, my newfound faith was simple. If the Bible said it, I just believed it. If Jesus said, you can do these things I'm doing and even greater things, I said, yeah. When Jesus told Peter to come to him walking on the water, I actually tried it in my friend's pool. (laughs) I almost pulled a kid out of his wheelchair and told him to walk in front of a quad full of kids at my school. I felt compelled by the Spirit to do it at the moment, and I beat myself up for years afterwards that I didn't respond in faith to the prompting of the Spirit. Later, as a youth pastor on staff at a large church, I had gone with a couple of the more seasoned pastors to pray for one of our youth group kids who was going in for surgery. Jared had a tumor on his pituitary gland that had caused him to stop growing. As we gathered around his bed just before the surgery to remove the tumor, the older, wiser pastors prayed that God would guide the doctor's hands and comfort the family and give Jared courage. I felt holy indignation at their faithless prayers. Just our presence there at the hospital would give them courage and comfort. Why not pray that God would take away the tumor? So I did. I prayed boldly that the doctors would find no tumor and that God would be glorified by the miracle. When they went in, the tumor was gone. They couldn't explain it, but I could. God had healed him. If we just have faith and don't wuss out with these self-fulfilling prayers, God will act. (laughs) Well, it should be no surprise that I prayed for my mom. I prayed for her with deep assurance and faith that God would heal her. She prayed too. She called the elders of the church, actually of several churches, since she was so well-connected in the community, to come and pray for her and anoint her with oil. She had a dream where Jesus whispered in her ear, you are completely healed. She believed that it was from God. She wasted down to 85 pounds, still believing that God had healed her and never entertaining a moment's doubt. Actually, about two weeks before she died, she changed her interpretation of her dream. After a family friend who was a doctor convinced her that she was in the last stages of dying and had a matter of a few days left. He had seen it plenty of times before, and though he was a believer, he believed she was about to die. So her interpretation changed. What Jesus meant was that she was healed completely, as in permanently, in heaven, where there's no more sickness or crying or pain. God wanted her completely well in heaven, not temporarily well on earth. She got to graduate early into eternity. Lucky gal. She took the opportunity of those last two weeks to say goodbye to everyone she knew and have great closure. She spoke about heaven and looked forward to going there with the same confidence she had displayed before about being healed. She called friends she hadn't seen in years to tell them to trust in Jesus, whom she would be meeting soon, because she wanted them to be in heaven with her someday. Cancer sucks, but at least it gives you the opportunity to say goodbye. It's much better than getting a call in the middle of the night about a car accident. We got to have some good closure. Everyone said goodbye and asked forgiveness for all the stuff we put our mom through. We ended things well. We had an around-the-clock vigil just waiting for her to die, and when we finally left, she did too. We got the call to come back to the house, and we sat around her dead body and thanked God she was in heaven. And it was beautiful, actually. But it opened up some questions for me. If she was as confident about being healed as she was about going to heaven, what if she was wrong about that too? If God doesn't heal in response to believing prayer, and if he doesn't mind putting those he loves through incredible suffering, how am I supposed to make sense of God and his ways? What's the use praying for healing if God gets to interpret it his own way and heal someone by killing them? By the way, who caused that cancer? If God could have prevented it and didn't, then isn't he responsible? All these questions and the emotional turmoil of losing my mother sent me into a spiral of depression. 
where I watched X-File marathons around the clock and then decided to plant a church. <laughs> it was the late 90s and the X-Files was asking questions about faith and proof and how we know. The truth is out there. Mulder believed in all kinds of unprovable strangeness, Scully only in what she could prove by science. They were both after certainty. He wanted to see and experience unlikely and unexplainable phenomena firsthand. She wanted to disprove it and come up with a reasonable explanation for everything. I was feeling the same way. My Mulder imagination wanted to hold on to my faith in the God I thought I had known since my youth, but my Scully brain kept throwing the evidence back in my face. So I did what any reasonable person would do in my state of uncertainty. I started a church. Looking back on it, I know it doesn't make sense, but it seemed to at the time. A lot of people were like me looking for a balance to their inner molder and scully. So we started a church called Mercy. We met in a bar to reach out to the lost and ended up attracting renegade Christians. But it was a great adventure. When we were looking for funding for our fledgling church startup, I talked to lots of people. Having never been in a denomination, I wasn't that familiar with the distinctives of each. All I knew about denominations I learned from friends in seminary who were complaining about the politics. I wanted none of it. But now, for financial reasons, I was ready to set that aside and sell my soul to the highest bidder. <laughs> well, not really. I was just faced for the first time with having to weigh what I really believed and what I was willing to compromise. The decision to start a church and be the pastor all of a sudden made me the expert on what we believed. I had to decide where we stood on baptism, women in ministry, church government, eschatology, soteriology, strategy, pneumatology. I was a youth pastor. I was just finishing seminary. My mom had just died. I wasn't exactly sure what I believed. One of the sources we looked to for help was the newly forming Acts 29 Church Planning Network. A pastor from Boca Raton, Florida had given Mark Driscoll a bunch of money to start his church, and Mark told me to give him a call. When I did, he told me that he wanted to help young church planters plant, quote, good reformed churches with none of that Arminian or dispensational crap. <laughs> I thought I knew what the words meant, but I wasn't quite sure why he was so riled up about it. <laughs> so I asked J.P. Jones, who taught at Biola and was on staff at, at the church, and J.P. said, oh, you're an Arminian. Now that scared me. Be because in my house growing up, that was the theological equivalent of being a communist. And I knew I didn't want to be that. I realized that even though I was graduating from seminary, I, I didn't really know where I stood, what I believed, or what team I was on. So I stepped up my quest for certainty. Meanwhile, my courtship with the Evangelical Covenant Church was leading me to investigate the Lutheran and Pietist roots of that movement. But it was the covenant's acceptance of infant baptism that led me to an issue of R.C. Sproul's Table Talk magazine. It was there that I was introduced to certainty. Sproul and Reformed people in general are certain and clear. I was attracted to that. Mike Horton's putting amazing back into grace convinced me that there was a right and historic way to interpret the scripture and understand God. The names of all the heavies in church history that began to stack up on the side of the reform camp convinced me that I wanted to be on their team. Now I knew why David Nicholas from Boca Raton was so passionate about planting good reformed churches. This stuff matters. I was certain. It was so good to be certain about my faith and to have an answer to every question. I no longer had to piece together answers off the top of my head. They had been settled 400 years ago. I just had to memorize them in the catechisms and confessions, and of course I had to reasonably defend them. But that was easy to do because they really held well together within the logic of the system. This was a welcome break for my otherwise unfettered mind. It was like the strange comfort and safety a stallion must feel in a corral. I had room to graze, but not to wander off. The theological fence kept me safe, and it helped me know where I stood. I read the Puritans, the Reformers, and every book R.C. Sproul, Mike Horton, Doug Wilson, John Piper had written. I listened to sermon tapes and every series by Reformed teachers that I could find. I immersed myself in back issues of modern Reformation and table talk. I was so hungry to learn and I felt that I had finally found a certain truth. Meanwhile, my theological quest made for an interesting ride for my newly planted church. Actually, it never really got planted. It was more of a potted plant, <laughs> changing pots too often to ever be rooted in one place. 
the physical and theological moving eventually led to the decline and disillusion of the church that I had loved and led somewhat erratically over the four and a half years of its life. When we finally closed the church, I went back to school full time. I wanted to get re-educated in the best reformed tradition, so I went to Westminster Seminary in Escondido. It was there I hoped to find the certainty I was after. I was excited to learn and study full time. I could master Greek and Hebrew and theology and philosophy and how to really study the Bible and know exactly what it means. I could find a denomination where everyone agreed about everything they believed. <laughs> Little did I know that what I would actually find would be the undoing of my certainty. The whole thing came to a head during a winter break. I was in Chicago for a three-week class at North Park Seminary, the History and Theology of the Covenant. This was the last class in my orientation program for ordination in the Evangelical Covenant Church. I was using my time in Chicago to decide if I wanted to move ahead with ordination in the Covenant or if I should move to a more certain and reformed denomination. You see, the covenant isn't reformed. It's purposely non-confessional. It's what Peter Berger termed a centered set rather than a bounded set group. Groups are either defined by a central thing which unites them or a set of boundaries that defines their limits. The covenant is centered around some common affirmations regarding the Bible as God's word, the church as a fellowship of believers, the necessity of regeneration, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the need to proclaim the gospel in word and deed. People affirm these minimal basics and they disagree about all sorts of other things. And this was difficult for me. I, I, I was now certain about what I believed and I wanted the comfort of walking with like-minded people who believe the same way I do. And the reformed denominations I was considering are by contrast bounded groups. They're defined by their confession. Typically the Presbyterian ones are defined by the Westminster Confession and Catechisms and the Reformed ones by the Three Forms of Unity, the Belgic Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort. These lengthy documents define what is certain and what's to be believed and taught. And deviation is not taken lightly. In fact, there are two kinds of professors at Reformed seminaries, dogmatic and careful. The dogmatic ones are fun to listen to. You know, you always know where they stand on issues. They go into rants in the middle of their lectures about the dangers of semi-Pelagianism or the errors of someone who has recently transgressed the boundaries of 16th century orthodoxy. Guns always loaded. They're just waiting for someone to step out of line theologically so they can blast away. It's something very deep in our Protestantism that we're always looking for something to protest. The careful professors are orthodox too. They know their stuff. They're not quite as dogmatic, but they're careful not to ever say anything that could be taken as free thinking. When they, when they do propose an idea that could be controversial, they couch it in the language of understanding the different views within the Reformed community. They may even explain without sarcasm the views of evangelical Christians and others outside of the Reformed family. These men, and I don't mean that in a generic sense, it's always men, have to always be careful what they say because they can lose their jobs for one renegade thought that gets outside the fence of their confession. Case in point, Peter Enns, who at the time was I writing this, uh, a brilliant professor from Westminster, was brought up on charges and dismissed because he articulated what most scholars believe but doesn't technically fit within the confession. Anyway, back to my story. I was enjoying the class in Covenant Church History and Theology, mostly because of the train rides into downtown Chicago each night where my classmates and I would debate all the topics we were studying in a friendly way over beer and Chicago pizza. Women in ministry, believers versus infant baptism, the nature of the atonement, eschatology, what holds denominations together in mission. These were all important topics. And the spirit of our discussion was true to the spirit of the covenant. Friendly, thoughtful, and honest, as much trying to understand as to be understood. There was no reason to hold back opinions and plenty of room to explore ideas. It was an invigorating and free climate that encouraged charity and scholarship. Meanwhile, back in California, an email discussion on a message board at Westminster had brought up more of a bandwagon than a discussion. A well-known seminary-affiliated Presbyterian pastor in the local area had written a scathing email about why Christians should boycott the soon-to-be, uh, the soon-to-premiere Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ, since it was a clear violation of the second commandment not to make images of God. He went on to rail against Rick Warren for sharing his pulpit with Mel Gibson, a Catholic, at the screening they had for pastors, and to criticize any pastor who would go to such a screening. Several students jumped on the bandwagon of criticism, 
none having seen the movie or talked to either Mel Gibson or Rick Warren about it. It was all hearsay, gossip, slander, and accusation in the name of defending orthodoxy. I had been at the screening at Saddleback. I'd heard Mel Gibson speak. I'd read the Ten Commandments. And the only one I saw being violated was the one about bearing false witness against your neighbor. So I wrote a response arguing for why it wasn't a violation of the Second Commandment, why I thought it was wrong to criticize people to others rather than going to them. And the firestorm of controversy that ensued over the next couple of months finally ended with the president of the seminary having the last word on the school's printed publication. And he was not on my side. In fact, when I came back to school after the break, many looked on me with suspicion. I was one of them, the evangelicals. <laughs> Two professors secretly admitted that they agreed with me, but they couldn't say it publicly or they'd lose their job. You see, that's the nature of bounded set groups. They're always wary of those near the edges. Since they're so certain about what is true and right, there's no room for those with different perspectives. They must be silenced or excommunicated or burned at the stake. It's just how it works. And I realized in the midst of this experience that the covenant is a better fit for me. They knew how to argue lovingly. They listened. They had unity in the essentials and weren't on a perpetual witch hunt. And while that episode cured me of my desire to be on the certain team, it didn't make me against Reformed theology. I just gave up wanting to be on any team that was so exclusive. I actually went to one of Rick Warren's purpose-driven church seminars and realized he was not as big a sellout as everyone in the Reformed world, including me, had thought. He was actually very biblical. Go figure. <laughs> I realized that when I allowed people to speak for themselves and didn't write them off for not being in my camp, I realized that there was much I could learn from many different traditions within Christianity. Instead of seeking uniform certainty, I welcomed the insights of diverse strains of Christianity and even people that disagreed with me. You can call me a liberal, but that's much easier than being a fighting fundamentalist. So what's after certainty? I started out after certainty. I found it, then I lost it. Now I'm not so much uncertain as I am post-certain. <laughs> that probably makes sense to a few of you. Bottom line is that though I believe in ultimate reality and absolute truth, I believe just as much that I don't really know what it is. I think I have a pretty good hunch but every time I learn something new, I'm amazed at how I have to keep revising my belief system. Maybe the enlightenment, modernity, post-modernity, post-post-modernity, you know, is not so much a way to look at the history of thought as it is a metaphor for growing up. As a kid, I believed in magic. The world was mysterious and dangerous. When I became a teenager, I learned to question everything and learned the tricks behind the magic that took away the magic and made things quite black and white. Life has a way of making us question what we thought we knew. So as I grew up, I doubted these foundations and grew disillusioned with the boxes. But as I'm older now, I'm content to give up knowing and explaining everything and to focus more on living than explaining. This is simply the journey of maturity. And I think it's a lot what the message of Ecclesiastes was. Rather than looking for an answer out there somewhere else, focusing more on living in the moment, in gratitude to God of what is. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I talked like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. My story is not so different. Paul, the great apostle who wrote half of the New Testament and was responsible for most of the early growth of Christianity throughout the Middle East and Europe, continues on saying that he only sees things like in a funhouse mirror. He has an idea, but he doesn't know fully until he sees face to face. The good news is one day he expects to see and know God the way God sees and knows him completely and accurately. Until then, Paul is content with three things, faith, hope, and love. Faith is not certainty. Hope is not certainty. Love is not certainty. Faith looks back on what God's done and how he's kept his promises and it trusts that he'll do the same in the future. Hope looks forward to the day God will finish what he started in expectation that he is faithful. And love looks outward in the present to live connected to God and others with deep affection and goodwill. None of these requires certainty. 
I'm still a work in progress. I do not claim to have arrived or to be enlightened. I think I see better now, but I remember that everything I think I know, I know only as one looking in a cloudy mirror. One day I'll see face to face. And I look forward to that day because I have faith in Jesus as the perfect revelation of the true God who loves and forgives us. I have hope that one day he will return to restore all things. And I love my wife, my kids, my friends, my church, my neighbors, even my enemies, believing that it's all that really counts and all that really lasts. And that's how my faith works after certainty. Yours can too. You can trust the God Jesus revealed. That's what faith is. It's not about having all the right answers. It's about trusting a person. You can hold on to hope that he's got the future, whatever the details. And you can love God and people around you. And those things are a choice. Even if you're quite delusioned with life like the critic of Ecclesiastes. Faith, hope, and love remain. And the greatest of these is love. So I'm going to invite the band to back, come back up. And we're going to have a little response time. Um, I know there are some of you that are in the middle of a season like this. Others of you that aren't. For those of you that aren't, I just hope this will help you have compassion on those that are and to give them time to not overreact and freak out and try to fix them when they're in the middle of it because it'll probably just drive them away. But to give them space. And if you are in the middle of it, I just want to say you're welcome here. This is a church. It's safe for you to be in process. It's safe for you not to have all the answers. Um, and when we sing these songs, sometimes we don't all feel them when we start singing them. And part of why we sing them is so that we can get our feelings to catch up with what we know to be true and what we want with all our heart to believe. And so we sing it and we believe it and we trust God even in spite of sometimes how things feel. And so um, we're going to have this opportunity where you can just respond where you're at or if you want to go to the, the, the sides and receive communion or receive prayer or give an offering or whatever, you can do that. Um, but let's, let's do this together. God, would you help us as your people um, to be honest, to be honest with where we're at, to be honest with what we believe and what we don't and how, um, where we're at in the process. God, I thank you that you don't always leave us there. I thank you that you didn't leave me in this same spot where I was 10 years ago, but I do thank you that it's the kind of thing that's in the scripture and it's the kind of thing that you want us to, to know that it's okay. So God, I, I pray that you would just encourage your people now. Speak to all of us in Jesus' name, amen.